You know, when Paige talks about being uh, new and young with young kids, I miss those days. I'm old with old kids. So we're going to have a special get-together for the old people with old kids. You can come join me, and yeah, it'll be fun for us, some of you. Uh, it is good. We're glad you're with us, especially those online that are joining us. It's crazy we're talking about Christmas already, although it feels like it. Uh, Thanksgiving. Don't skip Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, and before we get into the sermon this morning, uh, we're going to wrap up our series. I want to just talk to you about uh, what comes up in our Advent. We be- next week begins the season of Advent, which is a, a Latin word, Adventus, uh, meaning arrival, where Christians historically for thousands of years have celebrated by preparing themselves for the arrival of Jesus, looking back at his first arrival, the nativity, the birth, and also looking forward to his eventual return, two arrivals of Jesus. And we live between the arrivals, don't we? We live between the first and the second coming of Jesus. And that's, we're going to begin that season of celebration and anticipation together. And one of our traditions is that every year at Advent, we tell you a story about a serve-the-world partner we want you to pray for and consider being generous toward. Speaking of generosity, it's, this is the season, right? Black Friday, where we're going to spend a crazy amount of money. And then Giving Tuesday, where you're going to get all kinds of online pressure to give. But for those of us that are followers of Jesus, generosity is meant to be a lifestyle. It's the way that we live, to be generous people, with our time, with our words, with our resources as well. And for those of you that are members of this church or regular attenders, you call this your spiritual family and your church home. And if you're faithfully giving to the mission of God here, I want to say thank you. Your generosity makes a difference, now more than ever. The opportunities for the gospel and the needs in our community and our world are greater than ever. So thank you. Uh, and we're going to tell you a story about a Serve the World partner um, we want you to consider praying for and being generous toward in addition to your regular giving to the church. We can't, this is a unique challenge this year. Our partner is a couple that grew up in this area, but they're serving the, the Lord in a, in a war-torn country in Africa. We can't even tell you their names for their own safety. But they're doing remarkable things. God is moving in their lives. And they have an opportunity uh, to develop what's called Hope School. A Muslim man gave them a massive facility as a gift to build a school. It wasn't even on their radar to do this, but God led them to this. They already have 150 students. All that's left is the need, the financial resources to outfit this, this facility, and they could have 1,500 students to bring education, which is not available to these students, hope, safety, and the gospel. And we're going to rally as a church family to tell their story and to encourage you to th- pray for them and to consider what you might contribute to make that a reality. And we're excited to bring that story to you beginning next week. Let's pray now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning from all different uh, places. We come here, some of us excited, anticipating, ready to hear from you, some of us just barely getting here. But we're here, and you are here, and you are always speaking. So help us to listen. We pray this in your name. Amen. As I mentioned, uh, we wrap up our 10-week series called The Way. If you're new or just jumping in, you can check out these sermons. But the, the, the heart of this series has been understanding the way of Jesus in our day. In the book of Acts, the Christians, the first followers of Jesus in the world, were called people of the way. Because in the Roman world of the time of the first century, they didn't know what to call them. They lived so differently, such a unique character and quality of their life that they didn't know what to, how to refer to them. They called them people of the way. So we're trying to discover, well, what's that way? And what does it look like to live that way today, in our day? We've looked at a number of things, the way of self-denial, the way of generosity, the way of service, the way of prayer, the way of mission, the way of witness. Last week, John Dixon, if you missed this one, go back, watch it online. I encourage you, the way of justice from the Beatitudes, a fantastic sermon. Today we wrapped up with the way of gratitude. Not surprising, we're headed toward Thanksgiving in a few days, the, the, the national holiday of overeating, and we're going to enjoy that with our family and friends. I, I once read, uh, anybody heard of Corey Ten Boom, read The Hiding Place, maybe you know that, the person's story? So few hands, what a shame. Go read that book. Uh, Corrie Ten Boom in her book, The Hiding Place, talks about the time when she was in the concentration camp in, in Nazi Germany with her sister Betsy. And Betsy was always encouraging her, we must thank God, we must always thank God, even, even, in, even in prison, even in the concentration camp. And they said, Corrie Ten Boom says there were these horrible biting fleas uh, in, that, that were miserable in their beds. And she said, one thing to her sister, one thing I will never thank God for is these fleas. And Betsy said, you know, we, they had smuggled a couple of Bibles into the prison camp. 
and they were having Bible studies in a particular corner of the women's barracks. And the guards would never go to that section of the women's barracks. And then later, Betsy overheard the guards talking. The reason they would never go in there for inspections was because of the fleas. They were afraid of the fleas. So she said, Corey, we must praise and thank God for the fleas. I gotta be honest, I'm not sure I'm good at that. First Thessalonians tells us that we are to give thanks in all situations. Not for all situations, but in all circumstances. I'm not, I have a lot of learning and growing to do. Maybe you do as well. I'm okay at thanking God for the good stuff. But I'm not so sure about the fleas in my life. How about you? Today, the way of gratitude, it seems appropriate as I mentioned. There's a great deal of contemporary positive psychology research on the power of gratitude on mental health and on human flourishing. Harvard psychologists have done a study of the practice of gratitude. One particular study, number of studies that they did, was um, oh, oh, they took three different groups of people. Well, I'll read this quote to you from, the, from the, the, the summary conclusions of this study. In positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. So, be grateful, right? In this particular study, they took three groups of people uh, over 10 weeks. The first group, they said, every day, of the, of, of the, every day of the week for 10 weeks, you are to journal specific things you're grateful for. The second group, they said, every day of the week for 10 weeks, you are to journal those daily irritations in your life. The third group, they said, every day of the week for 10 weeks, you are to write down whatever occurs to you. Just keep a diary. Whether it's grateful or irritations, doesn't matter. They give no, no direction specifically. And it was remarkable, over 10 weeks, the group that was focused on gratitude daily in a journal had greater mental health, less visits to the doctors, they slept better, like all these physical, mental, and emotional benefits just from focusing on gratitude. Now, I know, personally, I think it's amazing and wonderful that popular mental health professionals, and positive psychology is catching up to what the Bible has been saying for over 2,000 years. It's, it's, it's really pretty remarkable. But there is a profound difference between gratitude in general and the Christian posture, or what we're calling the way of gratitude. The story we're going to look at together, and there's lots of places we could go in the New Testament, is, comes from Luke chapter 17. It's the story of Jesus and a remarkable encounter with 10 men and what we can learn about the way of gratitude, and most importantly, about the way of Jesus. So let's look at Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. Now, Luke, who wrote Luke, obviously, and the book of Acts, was a physician. Highly educated man, not one of the 12 disciples, but knew them personally, journeyed with them, watched them, observed them. And he wrote uh, a part one and a part two. We've talked about this story of Jesus. Part one, the gospel of Luke, which is really the story of Jesus. Part two, the book of Acts, which is the story of the birth of the church. And he says in Luke chapter 1 that he set out to write a detailed uh, um, account, a thorough and detailed account of these things. So he's giving us details that matter. It's easy for us sometimes to read through this and miss some of the details, but I don't want us to do that. I want us to pause here. Look again at verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem. So Jesus traveling with his disciples. Where are they going? Good. Where are they going? Yes, they're on the way to Jerusalem. By the way, this will be the last visit to Jerusalem in Jesus' earthly life. He's going there, and he knows this, they don't, to eventually be betrayed, to suffer, and to die. But on the way, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. 
it's easy to brush right over this, but this is important. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, and he's passing between two regions. Now, you might not be familiar with geography of, the, of, the, of Israel of the day, so we'll give you a little map here just so we can explain this. So you see here on the map, whoop, there we go, between, now Galilee in the north, Jesus was born in Nazareth, there, He's from, actually born in Bethlehem. He's from Nazareth, is the town. And this is his region. Most of the New Testament gospel accounts take place in the north in Galilee, where he does a lot of his miracles and teaching, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water, fishers of men, all those stories happen in the north. Jerusalem's way down here. Where am I missing it here? Samaria, in between Galilee and Jerusalem, was a region of people that the Jews of Jesus' day hated them. They had intermarried with the Assyrians in the Old Testament. They considered them half-breeds, unfaithful. They weren't allowed in the temple. They didn't, have their, they didn't worship the same way, and they considered them to be unclean, almost worse than Gentiles. So Jews in Jesus' day would cross the Jordan River, travel south, and then cross the Jordan River to go to Jerusalem. You'll read in the New Testament stories about Jesus going from Jericho up to Jerusalem. That's that region right there. They would not go through Samaria, in other words. But we're told here Jesus is passing between, right on the border, between Samaria and Galilee, which is really interesting. That's not insignificant. He's passing right between insiders and outsiders. The Jews and the, the clean and the unclean, as it were. This will come back as we go. And as they come near to a village, Jesus and his disciples are approached from a distance by a group of 10 men, specifically 10 lepers. And they cry out from a distance for mercy. This is the first thing I want you to see here in the text, a desperate cry, a desperate cry. These 10 men cry out collectively to Jesus for mercy, and they're in a desperate situation. Their condition is hopeless. They feel helpless. And they make this plea to Jesus. Look again at verses 12 through 13. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. That's not insignificant again. Luke gives us these details to tell us something. They stood at a distance. Why? Because they were lepers. They were unclean. They were required to by law to keep their distance. They lift up their voice so that there's a group of 10 shouting from a distance, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. In that simple sentence, there's a lot to unpack there. One thing to note is if, you're des if your situation is desperate enough, you will cry out for mercy. If your situation is bad enough, helpless enough and hopeless enough. Some of you know this, but leprosy in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament was, um, the, the Greek word was an umbrella term for a whole range of skin conditions. And there's a lot of detail. If you ever read through the Bible, when you get to the, the uh, teachings in Leviticus on skin conditions, it's, it can be, that's the place where most people stop their, their New Year's resolution to read through the Bible. They bog down in, in Leviticus 13 and 14, right? right? But there's a lot of details about this. Part of it is the health code for the ancient world because they didn't understand infectious diseases the way we do. But nevertheless, there's a range of skin conditions, the worst of which is what we call today Hansen's disease. It, Hansen's disease really is a bacteria, <coughs> excuse me, that would attack the nerves. The nervous, it's very emotional. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. That would attack the nervous system. And so the reason lepers would um, have claw-shaped hands and lose appendages, and their nose would be misshapen and other things. It's not so much because of the disease, but because what the disease did, it desensitized you to pain. You could burn yourself, get an infection, and before you even realized that you couldn't feel it, the infection was so bad that you're, it's spreading throughout your body. It was a horrific disease. And the first reference to leprosy, Hansen's disease, is the story of Miriam, Moses' sister. That's about 1450 B.C. And from that day to this day, actually to 1982, there's no cure outside of a miraculous intervention, an unexplainable healing. There was no known cure for Hansen's disease. For 3,500 years, 
if you got leprosy and it, and it developed and, they, and the and incubation period was almost, could be five to 10 years, you wouldn't even know you had it. And then it started to manifest itself. For 3,500 years, you're in, it's incurable outside of the intervention of God. And it's horrific. Not just for its physical damage, but to what it does to you socially, emotionally, spiritually. You're cut off. You cannot live inside the family of God. You cannot live inside the town. You're cut off from the camp. Let's look at verses uh, from Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 through 46. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. Shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, cover your mouth so it's not up your lips so you're not breathing on people. They didn't know how this was spread. Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. That simple sentence, live alone. To be a leper was to be like a walking illustration of the effects of sin. In fact, the Jews of Jesus' day viewed those with leprosy as cursed by God. It's eating away at your body. You'll never touch those that you love again. You'll live outside of, of the cities and villages and towns in colonies in little groupings of those that are suffering the same way you are. And there you'll spend your days withering away, becoming internally and externally a shell of a human being, disfigured in your face, your extremities, and in your soul. It's really horrific to think about. So there's these 10 men in this condition and they cry out for mercy. This brings us to a merciful act. Notice again, these lepers cry out to Jesus and call him master. Epistates is the Greek word. It means one who has authority over. They're addressing him accurately. Jesus, master, you have authority over, over us and over this disease. Have mercy on us. Now, we hear the word mercy, and we tend to think, you know, don't punish us. Well, they're already being punished, they feel. We learned last week that the word mercy, actually, uh, eleomosunes in Greek, li literally means to, to do mercy, to do acts of mercy. What they're asking for is do something about our condition, not just feel sympathetic toward us, Jesus. They're appealing to divine authority, Jesus, Master, have mercy, do something about the condition we find ourselves in. They, they know that their only hope is the mercy of God. Isn't it good news that the Lord is merciful and gracious? Psalm 103, verse 8 tells us, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy and steadfast love. Jesus is the living, breathing, walking, talking embodiment of divine mercy. So they get this much right. They know their condition is hopeless and helpless and they know their only hope is divine mercy and they cry out to the right person for mercy. Look at verse 14. And when he saw them, again, don't miss these words. When he, Jesus, saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Those first four words, when he saw them. Sometimes I think when we find ourselves really alone, when you're really hurting, one of the best things to know is that somebody sees. That somebody sees you. That somebody really does see and know what you're dealing with, what you're facing. I think this is significant. Jesus obviously physically knew they were there. They're shouting at him. But he saw them in their desperate condition. He saw their need. And he knows what they need. You're, you're not invisible to God, friends. Sometimes we, we, we believe that lie. You're never invisible to God. He sees you. Now, Jesus does not approach them, and he doesn't touch them. 
which was illegal to do. For them to come in contact with Jesus, you would become defiled or unclean. But interestingly, in Luke chapter five, you might know this story, just a couple chapters earlier, Luke chapter five, Jesus cleanses or heals one leper, and do you know how he does it? He touches him. The leper says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing, touches him and says, be clean. He touches him before he cleans him. And the great lesson from this story in Luke 5 is that the, Jesus cannot be defiled. He is cleanness. So he cannot, he cannot be defiled. He is the one that cleanses that which is defiled or unclean. But here in this story, he doesn't touch them. You'd think, well, that's how he does it, right? He goes and touches. So we would expect that he'd come to these 10 and lay hands on them one after the other right down the row and, and heal them. He doesn't do that. What, one point to, to make of this, and this is easy for us to miss, is that the, Jesus' healing, it's not the method that matters, it's the man. He can do it however he wants. He can spit in the dirt and make mud and put it on somebody's eyes. He can say a word to a Roman official, go home, your daughter's healed. He can do it by touching. He could do it by just thinking it. He knows people's thoughts. He doesn't, the method doesn't matter. There's no magic in his method. He's the son of God. He is divine mercy incarnate. He can heal however he wants or however he chooses. In this case, he says to them a simple command. Go and show, which is interesting, isn't it? He says, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Now think about this for a minute. You're a leper. Your whole life is spent outside of the city or the village or the town. You cannot go into the town. You cannot approach anyone, let alone a priest. You have leprosy. And Jesus says, I'll go and show yourselves to the priest. What would you think? Uh, it's not actually what I was asking for. I was hoping you'd heal me. And he's going to. There are a few reasons, though, I think that Jesus gives them this command. One, he's affirming the Old Testament law, God's commands. He's telling them to obey the law. And the priests served as like not only the religious leaders, but like a public health official in this case. And to go show yourself to the priest was a way of getting you back into community. The priest had to declare you clean so you could be welcomed back into the family, into the community. Second, He's putting uh, his d divine authority to heal on display. Sh if they go show themselves the priest, what are the priest going to ask? What happened to you? How did you get well? Did you, what, what, did you find some ivermectin or something? How did this work? Right? Some of you are like, hey, 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 can we laugh about that now? We can laugh about that now. It's over. Right? <laughs> what, how did it work? How did you get healed? I, I just know this man, Jesus. I just did what he said. He's, Jesus is putting his divine authority on display to the priest. Now, in Luke 5, when he heals the leper, he tells the leper, don't say anything about this. It's not time yet. But here, he knows it's time. He's not hiding any, who he is anymore. He knows that he's approaching what he came for. The forgiveness of sin by giving his life. Third, I think he's putting the faith of these men to the test. Are you willing to do what I tell you to do before any results? Boy, I haven't think about this in my life. Am I willing to just do what he says? Or do I want some evidence first? Am I just willing to do what Jesus tells me to do? Or do I want some, some guarantee for how it's going to go? That it's going to work out the way I want it to. Jesus says, go. Show yourselves to the priests. And? Don't miss this, friends. And as they went, they were cleansed. As they did what he told them to do, something happened. Some of you, and I know this is true for some of you, have not really been changed by Jesus. Not because you haven't heard him, because you won't go. Because you will not do what he asked you to do. You haven't surrendered. You won't, in humble obedience, just do what he asks you to do. And maybe that what he's asking you to do is just kneel down and confess your need for him. 
You don't actually believe that he exists. You've heard, you come, you like the whole spiritual thing, but you have not repented, meaning you haven't got on your knees and said, I have no hope or help but you. Doing what he asks you to do starts there. And these 10 men do. And all of them are cleansed. All of them are healed. They were healed on the way in the midst of their obedience. Now, their obedience did not heal them. Don't make this mistake. It's, they didn't heal themselves by obeying. Jesus healed them. But he did it as they obeyed him. He did it as they did what he asked them to do. Some of you are, 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 are praying and, and asking God to do something in your life. And he's saying, will you do what I ask you to do? This brings us to a grateful response. A grateful response. You might be thinking, oh yeah, wait, wait. Wasn't the sermon about gratitude? We've been talking all about healing. Well, here it is. Luke 17, verses 15 through 16. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, when he saw, remember Jesus saw them, when he saw that he was healed, this is the key phrase, turned back. Praising God with a loud voice and fell on his face at Jesus' feet and giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. This is the whole story. Like, there's always, when Jesus, in these encounters, there's always a turning point, a moment of tension that, that surprises, and this is that moment. Ten men, Lord have mercy. Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest. They're probably like, oh, I don't know what else to do. Let's do what he says. We're desperate enough to do whatever he says. What other hope do we have? They do, and they're all cleansed. One sees, like, he has fingers again. The stench of the infection is gone. His face isn't defigured. He can speak in an audible way because of the distortion of it. Like, think about what's happening here. Physically changed can't even believe what's happened. And turns around and goes back to the one who did it. Now, does that mean that the other nine were ungrateful? Well, yes and no. It doesn't mean they weren't thankful for their healing. Absolutely, they're going to the priest. He's gonna pronounce us clean. We get to go home. We get to hug our family again. We get to be back in, into the world which we were cut off from. I'm certain they were thankful. The difference is one returns to the one who healed him. Christian gratitude is not a general sense of thankfulness. You know, you're gonna get together in a couple days and your mom or grandma's gonna say, list something you're thankful for around the table, right? You're gonna, you're gonna say something, which is good. We're, we're do okay at what are we thankful for. But who are you thankful to? Can you connect that thing to the one who gave it to you ultimately? James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from your Father in heaven. This is Christian gratitude, to recognize what's been given to us, to turn around and head straight to Jesus, the one who did it for us. To, and, and look at what it says. He heads back, praising God with a loud voice. I imagine that this, like, this way, he's walking back to Jesus, shouting at the top of his lungs. Singing, shouting, praising God. Can you believe what has happened to me? And when he gets to Jesus, he falls on his face and worships him. This is the only appropriate response to a miraculous healing in our lives. And anyone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, you've had a miraculous healing in your life. You've had your sins forgiven. You've been cleansed. You've been set free. Your soul, which was distorted and disfigured and cut off from God, has been healed. Oh, I, I know in the Chicagoland suburbs, we don't look like lepers. We, put on, we look good, most of you anyway. Look pretty good this morning. But the, this, and this is one of the things that's a challenge for us. The spiritual reality is, apart from the healing power of Jesus, we are leprous in our souls, sinful cut off, without hope and without help. 
And in this way, as, as I said a moment ago, the leper is a, a symbol of the, the, the consequences of sin. He's also an example of how we respond when Jesus touches us and heals us. Do the blessings of your life move you to praise God? We'd like to say yes. But how often do we just go our way? We're thankful in a sort of general sense, but it isn't located in the person of Jesus Christ. We, I think we live in a culture of gratitude deficiency because we don't know how desperate our condition is. And we don't identify what he has done with the one who's done it. So the way of gratitude begins by recognizing your desperate condition, crying out to Jesus for mercy, and returning to him in praise and thanksgiving. Now, notice, we don't learn that he's a Samaritan until the very end of this, this, this verse. So he's a double outcast, right? He's a leper, and he's a Samaritan. I mean, he, he cannot, even if he was cleansed, go into the Jewish temple. He cannot go into the, the court of Gentiles. He cannot go into the court of the Jews. He cannot go into the holy place, let alone the most holy place. But what can he do? He can come to the Holy One himself, and so can you. All of us can. This outsider Samaritan did what the Jews were supposed to do. Returns to the Messiah, the one. This brings us lastly to the true healing. We'll go quickly here. A true healing. Ten cry out for mercy. One returns in praise and thanksgiving. Ten were cleansed. One is saved. Ten receive physical healing. One receives spiritual healing. Look at verses 17 through 19. And Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? What a question this is. Where are the nine? We ought to hear that and say, where am I? Where are you? Where did they go? Where are they? Was no one found to return and give praise to God? Notice this phrase, praise to God. What does this one leper do? He returns to Jesus, falls on his face. What is Jesus saying here? There are those who would say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He's saying it right here. Was none found to return to give praise to God? This one returned to Jesus to give praise. Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm God. I'm the one who healed you. Except this foreigner. Now, this, this is a Greek word, aliotes, which means uh, of another race, meaning not a Jew. This outsider, socially and religiously, is the one who gets it right. Jesus loves to turn the whole insider-outsider thing on its head because the truth is, until you meet Jesus, you're an outsider. All of us are outsiders. Ephesians chapter two says we're without hope and without God in the world until he finds us and heals us and brings us in. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This phrase, made you well, is interesting so there's three different Greek words used here. One for cleansed, katarizo, to be purified. One for healed, which means uh, to be cured. And then this last phrase, made you well. Some of your translations might say saved you. It's the Greek word sozo. And it always, it's over, used over 100 times in the New Testament, and almost always it's used in, every time it refers to forgiveness of sins, or, forget, or, or cleansing of your soul, it's sozo. What is Jesus saying here? 10 got the physical healing. 10 got their life improved here and now. One was saved. I think one of the great tragedies is that many of us are coming to Jesus for an improvement of our life. Make my life better now, Jesus. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if we have hope in Jesus only for this life, we are to be pitied more than any other people. Jesus did not come to make your life better now. At least not only that, but to save you, to forgive you, to heal you, and to set you free. What a shame if we come to church week after week and all we're looking for is a little help for the here and now, which is gone in a breath. What a tragedy. 
We don't access the true healing. And the story tells us, 10 get their life improved, one gets saved. The beautiful irony, this Samaritan, the outsider, receives salvation, sozo. Why? Because he recognizes Jesus for who he is. I've been thinking about this in my life. And as I said at the beginning, I have a lot of growing to do in gratitude. I want to be a grateful person, not once a year or when it's time to preach on it, but to be, have my life be marked by gratitude, to be full of joy of the blessings of God in my life, to not be the kind of person who's focused on what's wrong all the time, but to be constantly returning to God to give him praise. But I forget. Do you? I get distracted. Do you, is it just me? Do you? I love the phrase, one returned. So we want to give you a moment as we close the service to return to Jesus, to do that now in a few moments as we close this service. Anton's going to come and going to lead us through an exercise in gratitude as we close this service. I invite you right now to prepare your hearts. I'll pray and he'll lead. Father, we worship you and thank you that you are the giver of all good gifts and we confess that we forget. We take for granted. We are distracted. But here together now, we want to return to you, praise you, and give you thanks. Just where you're seated. Let's take some time to respond to the word that Jeff has just preached from. But not just respond with a song, respond with our minds and with our hearts, with our spirit. So right where you're seated, just let your mind slow down, your heart settle, not thinking about the thing we have to get to next, but focusing on his mercy and his grace in our life. So think about the relationships in your life and thank God for those people who have pointed you to Jesus. Thank him for those who have spoken truth to you, even if it was hard to hear. And thank him for those people in your life who have stood by you and believed in you, even when you did not believe in yourself. Let's take a minute. about circumstances in your life, past and present. Thank God for the opportunities he's given you to grow, to grow closer to him and to each other. Thank him for the way he has and continues to provide for your needs each and every day. Thank him for the challenges that he has helped you to face and overcome, even the ones that are extremely hard. Thank him even for painful circumstances that you would not have chosen, but through which he has revealed his grace to you. Let's thank him this morning. Last, we focus solely on who Jesus is. Thank him for loving you and pursuing you even when you run from him because he's chasing after you. Thank him for his unending mercy and grace to cover all your sin. And thank him for his sacrificial death on the cross so that you might have life in him. Let's thank him. Psalm 100 tells us we are to enter his presence with thanksgiving and to come into his courts with praise. It's a mistake if we think we do that just when we come to church. Because in a moment you're going to turn around and you're going to leave and you're going to enter his presence and his courts. Do so with thanksgiving and with praise. May the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Spirit, 
and the love of Jesus, the Son, surround you and fill you this week and every day. To him be glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. Amen. And go in peace.